So, um, hi everybody. Um, a very good morning, uh, afternoon, evening, or uh, whatever part of the world you are. You can uh, just uh, pick one of those. Hopefully, not night. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's so wonderful. It's uh, such an honor to have uh, Professor Edward Witten. Uh, from the Institute of Advanced Study, Princeton, uh, today, uh, uh, giving a talk to all of us as part of the uh, Mysteries of the Universe Institute lecture series of uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee in India. And um, um, I, I, though it's it's uh, it's so uh, uh, baffling to even uh, try to in quote unquote introduce Professor Witten, but uh, I think. Uh, because that is uh, customary, I would uh, I would venture to say the following. So, uh, Professor Witten uh, is uh, the Charles Simoni Professor at the at the Institute of Advanced Study, Princeton. Um, of course, um, um, there are there are so many things that you can say about him, and that itself would be actually a lecture or a seminar. But I think suffice it to say that um, uh, he is the only, the only, the first and the only physicist to have gotten the, the Fields Medal, which is uh, considered to be the equivalent of the Nobel in mathematics in 1990. And uh, actually, I just want to read out uh, what Michael Atiyah uh, actually said at the International Mathematical uh, uh, the Congress, the International Congress of Mathematics. Uh, uh, about Professor Witten, and here it goes. Uh, so he said, although he's definitely a physicist, uh, as his list of publications clearly shows, his command of mathematics is rivaled by few mathematicians, and his ability to interpret physical ideas in mathematical form is quite unique. Time and again, he has surprised the mathematical community by a brilliant application of physical insight, leading to a new and deep mathematical theorem. He has made a profound impact on contemporary mathematics. In his hands, physics is once again providing a rich source of inspiration and insight in mathematics. And I think uh, today's lecture is going to be, uh, 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 an, in fact, an example to actually testify to that notion. I would also say that uh, as anybody who was even remotely connected with high energy physics, I'm sure is already aware. But since we have so many students in the audience uh, as attendees today, which is great, so Professor Witten is actually credited with starting what is referred to as the second string revolution uh, by in fact announcing, so there is this annual strings conference and the one in 1995. So we are actually in, in some sense in the, the silver jubilee year of that uh, at uh, USC University of Southern California is where he proposed uh, the, I mean, what is now, what is known as M theory as essentially uh, the realization of the fact that different superstring theories, they arise in fact as different limits of the same theory. He has so many awards uh, and honors to his credit, but I would just mention a few. He is the first recipient of the Dirac Medal in 1985 at the uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics at Trieste, Italy. He's a recipient of the Albert Einstein Medal in 1985. I've already mentioned the Fields Medal in 1990. He got the National Medal of Science in 2002, the uh, Henry Poincaré Prize in 2006, the Lorenz Medal in 2010, Isaac Newton Medal in 2010. He's uh, a Fundamental Physics Laureate uh, of 2012. He is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. He, he became a fellow in 2012. He was voted as Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2004. So uh, with that, I think uh, I should, uh, I should uh, request very humbly Professor Witten to please deliver his lecture. Professor Witten. Uh, well, thanks Alok for the very kind, but perhaps too kind introduction. So my topic today, as you can see, is two-dimensional gravity and volumes of moduli spaces. So uh, the underlying fact is that it's difficult to understand gravity at the quantum level. And because that is the case, physicists have tried to find understanding by looking at simpler models in lower dimensions. Now, a natural place to start is two dimensions. You could start in one space-time dimension, but a one manifold has no intrinsic curvature. It could be embedded in space in a way that's extrinsically curved. The embedding in space is curved, but intrinsically it has no curvature. Two dimensions is the first dimension in which there is Ramanian curvature. 
like for example, a, a curved two-dimensional surface like the surface of the earth illustrates that. So two dimensions is the lowest dimension in which the curvature, which is so fundamental in gravity enters. Now, if you're going to make a theory of gravity in two dimensions, what is it going to be? Well, the first idea might be to imitate the Einstein-Hilbert action of four dimensions. And then the two dimensional Einstein-Hilbert action, which I'm trying to highlight. Well, anyway, it's here, I'm pointing to it at least. It's simply the integral of the Ricci scalar, the curvature scalar times the Riemannian volume form. But that doesn't work well to make a two dimensional theory because in two dimensions, according to the gauss benet theorem, the integral of the scalar curvature is a topological invariant, the Euler characteristic of the manifold Y. So we have to do something a little different if we're going to make a simple theory of gravity in two dimensions. It turns out that it's a better idea to add a real scalar field phi, that means simply a real valued field phi, along with a metric tensor. And then the simplest model you can make of two dimensional gravity is this one, where we, instead of just integrating the curvature scalar, we integrate the curvature scalar times this function phi. And I've also added a cosmological constant, though we could study the model without the cosmological constant. But for today, it's useful to add this constant. Now the action has been chosen so that the Euler Lagrange equation that you get if you vary the action with respect to phi just tells you that r plus two is zero. And you can think of that as a two dimensional analog of the usual four dimensional Einstein equations. But it's drastically simpler than the Einstein equations roughly because there are no gravitational waves in two dimensions. And more technically, because the Riemannian curvature in two dimensions is just described in terms of the Ricci scalar R. So in four dimensions, you'd have a Riemann tensor. The Einstein equations would tell you that the Ricci tensor vanishes, but the rest of the Ricci Riemann tensor remains and describes gravitational waves. In two dimensions, when we impose the Einstein equations, which specifies the curvature scalar, there's nothing left. And so there are no propagating waves. That's why this model is simple. Now, since the Einstein equations completely specify the curvature, the upshot is that all solutions look locally the same. Like a sphere, except curved in the opposite direction negatively. So, a negatively curved sphere, which locally looks like a saddle, is called a hyperbolic manifold. When I say a saddle, I mean literally the saddle you'd ride on a horse or a camel. That's a negatively curved surface. But he, in a moment, I'll show you another picture, which is from Wikipedia. Here's a sphere, positive curvature. Then the cylinder has zero curvature. And if we bend backwards, we get negative curvature. So roughly, any solution of our two-dimensional Einstein equations looks like a small piece of this surface, looks locally like a small piece of that surface. Now, so in this theory, all solutions of the Einstein equation, in other words, all hyperbolic manifolds, as I said, but just to repeat, hyperbolic manifold is just a synonym for a solution of the Einstein equations of this theory, this equation. So they're all equivalent locally, but globally, the geometry is not unique. For example, let's consider what's sometimes called a donut with G hall handles, which mathematically is a compact Riemann surface of genus G, which I'll draw for G equals two. So one handle, two handles. Hopefully, well, that's a rather schematic picture, but hopefully you can visualize it as the surface of a donut with two handles. So, as long as the number of handles or the genus is more than one, such a surface does admit a solution of our miniature Einstein equation, r plus two equals zero. However, the solution isn't unique. And the reason it's not unique is that, the, well, if you do find such a solution, there's, for example, a length around this circle, a length around this circle, a length around this circle. And those are global invariants. You don't see them locally. You have to go all the way around the loop. And those global lengths can vary. They become parameters of a solution. 
So without changing the topology of Y, which is simply the number of handles, there's some freedom to change its geometry, roughly the sizes of different handles, while still satisfying the Einstein equation. In fact, in genus G, the hyperbolic structures, in other words, the solutions of the Einstein equation, are parameterized by a manifold whose dimension is 6G minus 6. I'll call it M sub G. It's called the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G. It's been very intensively studied since it was introduced by Riemann in the 19th century. A lot of the reason for modern study is that the properties of this space are important in many branches of mathematics, even number theory. Now, sometimes we allow a two manifold to have boundaries, in which case it's natural to ask for the boundaries to be geodesics. So here's an important example, which is a sphere with three holes. So you have to try to imagine, since this is a very schematic picture, a negatively curved space that topologically is a sphere with three holes. And I've labeled the holes by real numbers B1, B2, and B3, which are meant to be the lengths of the corresponding holes, the lengths of the boundaries. So those boundary lengths can be specified independently. There's no constraint on them except that they are positive real numbers. But once they're specified, the solution of the Einstein equations is unique. No additional freedom. So in the jargon, the moduli space of three hold spheres with specified boundary lengths is just a point. But now you can see why that's not true for another surface. Here is a different picture of a surface of genus two where I'm emphasizing that it can be built by gluing together two three hold spheres. Now, the boundary of the three hold spheres, these circles here, had arbitrary lengths B1, B2, and B3. And those lengths become parameters of the hyperbolic surface of genus two. Three geodesic lengths and three more twists, which come about if you rotate one side relative to the other before gluing them together. So if you count parameters in this picture, you learn that a, high, a solution of Einstein's equations with genus two depends on six real parameters, which is six G minus six when G is two. And the same reasoning will give you the dimension of the moduli space for any number of handles. The subtlety though, is that although every hyperbolic surface of genus two can be constructed by this gluing, that can be done in many different ways. That's what makes it difficult to understand the moduli space. Now, so far I've been trying to give you an introduction to this simple model of gravity as a classical field theory, but let's discuss quantum mechanics. Well, first let's review the passage from classical to quantum mechanics. So one formulation of classical mechanics involves what textbooks usually call the principle of least action, but it would be more accurate to call it the principle of stationary action. The action for a particle with position x and momentum p is given by this simple integral, the integral of px dot minus the Hamiltonian. H is the Hamiltonian or energy function. Some of you may have be more familiar with the action written in a Lagrangian formulation, but I've written it in terms of the Hamiltonian, which is convenient for the two quantum mechanics. In defining the action, I considered a time interval where the time runs from T1 to T2. One formulation of Newton's laws of motion is that they're the condition that makes the action stationary for specified values of the initial and final positions of the particles. So Newton's laws say that the variation of the action under a small change in the path is zero. As I said, textbooks sometimes call this the principle of least action, but the action isn't really minimized, it's just made stationary. So it would be better to call it the principle of stationary action. However, a quantum particle does not just follow a classical orbit. As interpreted by Feynman, a quantum particle can travel on any orbit at all. 
and the amplitude for a given orbit is the exponential of the classical action times i, the square root of minus one, but divided by Planck's constant. Now, then Feynman said that to calculate the amplitude, the quantum mechanical probability amplitude for a particle that starts at x equals x1 at time t1 to end at x equals x2 at time t2, we have to integrate over all possible paths the particle could have followed with the exponential being, sorry, with the integrand being the exponential of the action times i over h bar. I see I've written it here with the parenthesis. Parenthesis should close around the h bar. So the integrand is supposed to be this, written in more detail to emphasize that it depends on the trajectory. Now, how does classical physics emerge when Planck's constant becomes small? When Planck's constant is very small, there's a massive calculation in the integral because nearby phases, nearby paths will have different actions and essentially random phases, which will all average out to zero, except that if you find a critical point where the action is stationary, then all the, random, sorry, then all the nearby paths have the same action and contribute with the same phase. So the dominant contribution comes from the path of stationary action, because as I said, all the nearby paths contribute with the same phase. So that was Feynman's explanation of how to recover classical mechanics from quantum mechanics when h bar becomes small. Now in quantum field theory, which we're trying to do when we discuss quantum gravity, Einstein's gravity is a field theory, so we're trying to do quantum version of field theory. We try to implement the same idea of integrating over all possible paths, but we have to be more general than to just talk about the path of a particle. In the case of particle mechanics, the path of the particle was a whole history of the system. And the analog in field theory is a complete space-time history. So Feynman's recipe applied to quantum field theory tells us that we have to integrate over all possible space-time histories. And what we integrate is the exponential of the action. So in JT gravity, that means we have to integrate over all metric tensors G mu nu and scalar fields phi. And what we have to integrate is the exponential of the JT gravity action. So formally, we have to consider the quantum path integral, the integral over all fields of the exponential of minus the action divided by the volume of the diffeomorphism group. So that's a formal recipe that reminds us that we're in a generally covariant theory. So we have to consider two histories equivalent if they differ by a general coordinate transformation a diffeomorphism. There are a couple of changes from the formula as I wrote it with Feynman. First, in quantum field theory, one frequently works in units where h bar is one. And secondly, I'm working in Euclidean signature where the i becomes a minus one. So that's why we're integrating the exponential of minus the action. But in a moment, the i will be back. Now, Feynman's discovery of the path integral was a big advance in understanding physics, but it was not a magic cure-all for the difficulty of understanding quantum field theory. Usually these Feynman integrals are very difficult to understand. But the action of JT gravity has been chosen to make this particular integral, ma integral manageable. The prototype of the integral that we have to do is this integral, which hopefully is familiar. It's a representation of a delta function as the integral of an exponential. What leads to this simple answer is that the integrand in the exponent, sorry, I, should, I wrote the integrand, but I should have said the exponent i phi b is linear in phi. And then we can do a simple integral over phi. Now, that's the reason JT gravity is simple. The action of JT gravity is chosen to be linear in phi. I exploited this once when I use, 
invoke the simple form of the classical equation of motion for phi. The classical equation of motion for phi said that r plus two was zero. That's the condition that this action is stationary when we change phi. And that was our simple Einstein equation. We're now going to reuse that fact to say that the integral is easy to do. We're going to do a field theory version of this baby integral representation of the delta function. So applied to JT gravity, we learned that the JT gravity path integral, if we integrate first over phi, we get a delta function saying that r plus two should be zero. And then with the help of that delta function, the integral over matrix modular diffeomorphisms basically goes away. You see, now the integral over matrix drastically simplifies because we only have to integrate over matrix that solve the classical equations. We got a delta function saying that r plus two is zero. Normally in quantum mechanics, you can't be sure that the classical equation is obeyed. But JT gravity is simple because even quantum mechanically, you can be sure that the Einstein equation is obeyed for the metric because the path integral first over phi gives you a delta function saying that the classical equation has to be obeyed. So as I said, the important thing is we get a delta function saying that the classical Einstein equation r plus two equals zero has to be obeyed. We normally would not get something as simple as that in quantum field theory. As I've said, usually in quantum physics, we can never assume a classical equation of motion is satisfied. However, despite the fact that we can assume that the classical equations are obeyed, there's still a lot of work to do. So that's because of something I told you before. The solution of the classical equations is not unique. Remember that in the case of a surface of genus G, of which this is one picture, there's a family M sub G of classical solutions. And this family depends on six G minus six parameters. The delta function delta of R plus two equals zero reduces us from an infinite dimensional Feynman integral over metrics to an integral over the finite dimensional space M sub G. But this integral in turn is difficult. M sub G is itself a Ramanian manifold. So it has a volume V sub G. And with a little more work, you can argue that the remaining integral over M sub G simply computes the volume of V sub G. So that's our result for the integral over all histories on a space time of genus G. The Feynman integral is equal to the volume V sub G of the moduli space M sub G. Now these volumes have been much studied in the last half century or so. They can be viewed as a special case of what's called intersection theory on the moduli space. As such, were studied by quite a few mathematicians and physicists of whom I was one roughly 30 years ago. A very new point of view on these volumes was introduced by Maria Mirzakhani in the mid 2000s. Maria Mirzakhani is the Iranian woman who became the first woman to win the Fields Medal. As a graduate student, she introduced a new point of view about the volumes and that was the work for which she first became known, although she went on to do many other things in her tragically short life. In the last part of my talk, I'll give you a, a short introduction to what Mirzakhani did on the volumes. But for now, we're going to proceed with the story of what they mean in quantum mechanics. Well, what do we learn by studying these volumes in the context of JT gravity? The study of simple models of gravity, such as this one, has been greatly reinvigorated in recent years by interpreting these models in terms of something called holographic duality, which was originated by Maldasena in 1997. I think Maldasena will be giving a lecture in this series in a few weeks. Probably he'll tell you more about the holographic duality or perhaps about other aspects of its applications to gravity in recent years. Holographic duality says that a quantum gravity theory in D space-time dimensions is supposed to be equivalent in some sense to an ordinary theory without gravity in D minus one dimensions. Now, if D is bigger than two, then D minus one is bigger than one. 
And the ordinary theory is a quantum field theory in D minus one dimensions. And that's going to be hard because quantum field theory is hard. But if D is two, then D minus one is one. In one space-time dimensions, quantum field theory just reduces to ordinary quantum mechanics. So the dual of JQ gravity would be, one would think, an ordinary quantum mechanical system. Quantum mechanics is much simpler than quantum field theory. So you'd hope that in this example, one could actually understand the duality between gravity in the bulk and ordinary quantum system on the boundary. Well, the dual system is supposed to live in what's called the conformal boundary of space-time, which is a subtle subject to explain, and it hasn't existed in the examples of geometries I've shown you so far. For our two manifold to have a conformal boundary, we have to consider not a compact Riemann surface as we've done so far, but an unbounded or non-compact manifold. So technically, the basic example is the hyperbolic disk, curly H, which is the unit disk in the complex plane with this metric, except I see I left the parentheses here on the left, but otherwise that's the metric of the hyperbolic disk. The conformal boundary in this representation is the circle at z equals one. But because the metric blows up at z equals one because of that factor in the denominator, the conformal boundary is actually infinitely far away. It's not part of the space. It's a sort of virtual boundary at infinity. So the idea that two dimensional gravity would have a particularly understandable holographic dual because d minus one is one in the case d equals two. So the, the idea of being able to understand holographic duality better in this case than we usually can is not new, but it only led to progress in the last few years when it was understood that it's important to work not with the whole hyperbolic disk, but with a very large region of it. So this is a picture of a disk, but remember, the metric of the disk blows up in such a way that distances diverge near the boundary. So I've drawn the boundary as if it's at a finite distance so you can see it. But in the metric, that boundary, that boundary circle is infinitely far away. Then we consider a very big piece U. Its area would diverge if it approached the boundary. We don't literally let it approach the boundary, but we take it to have a huge area, maybe e to the 100 in area as opposed to the infinite area if we took the whole disk. And then we'll do the JT gravity path integral on this huge region, not on the whole hyperbolic disk, but on a huge piece of it. Of course, to do this, we need a boundary condition. And the boundary condition roughly is that we specify the boundary and we also specify the value of the real field phi along the boundary. And then we take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, keeping beta fixed. And beta then becomes the inverse temperature of the dual quantum mechanical system. So it's technically a little different from what I've been saying, but the JT gravity path integral can again be computed exactly using some refinements of the arguments that were needed for a compact surface. So you have to use ideas of localization that go back to a number of mathematicians from 30 odd years ago, 40 odd years ago. And then you get an explicit answer for the partition function of the disk, which I've written as an integral over energy. Beta plays the role of an inverse temperature. So in quantum mechanics, to do quantum mechanics at temperature T, it's very frequently done by doing a path integral on a circle whose circumference is the inverse temperature called beta. So this computation, we try to interpret it as the partition function of the boundary quantum mechanics uh, at inverse temperature beta. And then the partition function is usually written as a sum over energies. But here we find we need a continuous integral over energies. And then energy E is weighted at inverse temperature beta by this thermal factor E to the minus beta E. 
but there's a density of states we need, rho of A, which comes out to be this one. So we get an answer for the partition function on the disk that we can write in terms of what looks like a density of energy levels. And holographic duality says that what we get is supposed to be the partition function of the dual quantum mechanics, well, on a circle of circumference beta, but more physically at inverse temperature beta. So the dual quantum mechanics has a Hilbert space, which I'll call curly J and Hamiltonian H. And it has a partition function, which is the trace of each of the minus beta H. And holographic duality seems to say that this function should equal the partition function of the dual quantum mechanical system. But a little thought will show that that can't work. For the trace of e to the minus beta h to be finite, h must have a discrete spectrum with energies e1, e2, e3, and so on, which moreover must tend to infinity fast enough. And then the partition function is a sum over energy levels which you can write as an integral over energy levels, but you need a delta function of delta of E minus EI. And I see I left the fact, left unfortunately left out the factor E to the minus beta EI, which should appear here. Now, but the important thing is that the dual quantum mechanics would tell us that we should get a discrete sum over energy levels. Instead, we got a continuous integral over energies. So there's no choice of Hamiltonian that will reproduce the JT gravity result. However, the discrepancy is very hard to see near the classical limit. The classical limit is the limit where the action is big. And okay, I didn't explain properly where this parameter comes in, but when we define the quantum theory, there's a, well, we could have had an arbitrary constant term in the action, which if you like comes from the fact that the action could have an Einstein-Hilbert contribution as well as the contribution I emphasized. So the path integral of JT gravity on the disk gives us the density of energies, which is the cinch function times the exponential of an arbitrary constant. But near the classical limit, the constant S naught is big and therefore rho of V is exponentially big. So in a sense, it's hard to see the difference between the output of JT gravity and the expected sum of delta functions if you're near the classical limit. So um, first of all, well, let me explain that more slowly. The classical limit corresponds to S naught being large, which is analogous to the fact that Newton's constant is small in the real world. If you're not a physicist, you might not be accustomed to thinking of Newton's constant as being small. What it means to say it's small is that the gravitational force between two particles like a proton and an electron is something like 10 to the minus 40 times the electrical force between the same two particles. So when you properly measure it in terms of microphysical constants, Newton's constant is extremely small, which in our JT gravity model, we would implement by S0 being very large and therefore the exponential of S0 being truly enormous. So uh, what I've written in the sentence is that S0 over four pi is the analog in this model of what in the real world is one over eight pi times Newton's constant. Now it's important that there's a big factor here. You would not confuse the cinch of two pi root E with a sum of delta functions, but you have to look very hard to distinguish the exponential of 100 times the cinch of two pi root E from a sum of very densely distributed delta functions. It takes extremely large energy resolution to distinguish this function from an equally dense sum of delta functions. So, okay, that's a fact, but it's also true that there is a discrepancy between them. But now I should explain the following. Though the computation in JT gravity didn't agree with what you would expect from holographic duality, that fact was actually not a complete surprise. Analogous computations going back to work of Gibbons, Hawking and others in the 70s always gave a similar problem. 
the problem is the essential mystery about quantum black holes. When you do a calculation that you know how to do, you get an answer like the answer we got in JT gravity with the cinch function that is suggestive of a smooth function. While well, quantum mechanics tells us that we should have a discrete sum of energy levels. Energy should have been quantized. So this problem has been with us since the discoveries of Gibbons, Hawking and others in the seventies. But the calculations were generally done in models like four dimensional general relativity. They were too complicated for a complete calculation. So there was always a possibility the problem would go away in a more complete calculation. What's new is that holographic duality and a variety of related developments have made it possible to ask the question in a model, the one I'm telling you about, JT gravity, that's so simple that you can do a complete calculation demonstrating the problem. Well, Saad, Schenker, and Stanford proposed that the holographic dual of JT gravity is not a particular quantum system, but a random ensemble of quantum systems. There were a few clues that pointed them in this direction, though I don't really have time to explain the clues. One was work of Alexei Kateyev on a random model, random ensemble that he applied to a model of 2D gravity. Then there were discoveries about 2D gravity in the early period, 30 years ago. And finally, there was Mariam Retsukani's work on the volumes, which I already mentioned briefly. Anyway, the idea of Stanford et al was to interpret the Hamiltonian of the dual quantum mechanical system as not a definite Hamiltonian, but a random matrix drawn from an ensemble. The ensemble is as follows. H will be an N by N Hermitian matrix with a very large M. Ultimately, we take N to infinity. Then we pick a suitable function T of M and we consider the measure but the measure is dh, which means integral over all matrix elements of h with just the simple Riemannian measure for the real and imaginary parts of all matrix elements. And then we integrate the exponential of minus n times the trace of a function of h. And z is a constant which is chosen so that the integral is one. In other words, z is what would be the partition function of the system. If the function T is quadratic, this is the Gaussian random matrix model studied starting in the 60s by Wigner, Dyson, and Meta, and subsequently by many others. We're actually interested in the case that T is not quadratic, so the measure isn't Gaussian. We take n to infinity adjusting the function T so that the eigenvalue density of a Hermitian matrix drawn from this ensemble converges in the limit to the answer we want the answer that comes from JT gravity. So this is a random ensemble of Hamiltonians, which has the right energy density, level density on the average. The proposal of Stanford et al was that this, the holographic dual of JT gravity is a random matrix ensemble with this property. Since there's not a definite Hamiltonian, there's not going to be a definite answer for the partition function. Instead, the partition function is going to be an ensemble average. So the ensemble average, so the partition function is the trace of e to the minus beta h. It's average in this ensemble, you calculate trace e to the minus beta h for a particular h but then you average over all H's with the measure that I described. So there are various ways to study this integral. The simplest thing you can do is ordinary perturbation theory, expanding in Feynman diagrams, treating the integral as a quantum field theory in zero space-time dimensions. As first shown by Hooft 46 years ago, this leads to an answer that involves a sum over oriented two manifolds. The first hint that the problem is connected to two-dimensional two gravity. If you expand in perturbation theory, you find for large n, a picture like this, the purple lines in the inside represent the propagator of the H field, except that the H field isn't a field, it's just a matrix. 
And the black line represents the trace, the operator whose expectation value you're trying to calculate. If you expand in perturbation theory, you'll find that the dominant Feynman diagrams are planar. They can be drawn on a disk with the boundary corresponding to the operator that you're interested in. So that's a fascinating fact, which would have made a different lecture. Uh, it's a fascinating fact, which is by now 46 years old, as I said. So uh, I'm not going to explain it in detail, but it's what you get if you expand this problem in perturbation theory. So the diagrams with disk topology, which I've drawn, like this one, are dominant for large n or large e to the s naught. In higher order in one over n, we get diagrams that can be drawn on the surface of higher genus, again with a boundary corresponding to the operator whose average we're trying to evaluate. For example, although perhaps not well drawn, this is a genus one surface, a donut with one handle. It has a single boundary, which again corresponds to this operator. And the purple lines are a Feynman diagram that I've drawn on the surface, which again, has lines that end on the boundary. So this would be an example of a genus one contribution to the expectation value of the partition function. So this diagram is of relative order one over n squared, which after double scaling, it becomes e to the minus two s naught. In general, the contribution of a surface of genus G is suppressed by a power of s naught that depends on G. All this just comes from a standard analysis of Feynman diagrams. So the expectation value of the partition function can be written as a series in powers of e to the minus s naught. And the proposal of Saad et al, Saad, Schenker, and Sanford, is that in this series, the term proportional to the power I've written here should be the JT gravity path integral on a surface of genus G with one conformal boundary. For g equals zero, this is true by definition. The function t of h used in defining the random matrix ensemble was simply chosen to reproduce the correct function a naught of beta, which is the Laplace transform of, of the density of states of JT gravity. The test is whether this is true in higher genus. So to decide if it's true in higher genus, we need to know something I told you before. JT gravity in genus G computes the volume VG of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. So we have to compute the coefficient in the matrix model AG and compare it to VG. Computing AG involves some additional techniques we don't have time for. But Saad et al were able to compute AG directly in the matrix model. Well, they were able to do that by using the way Einard and Orenton had reinterpreted Mirzakhani's results for the volumes. And thus they were able to confirm that AG equals VG. So it's true that in this very simple model of quantum gravity, JT gravity, the holographic duality involves a random ensemble of quantum systems, not a specific quantum system. So that's a conceptually challenging result and researchers are still grappling with the implications especially with whether something similar is true in higher dimensions and more realistic theories. And if not, why not? I think it's believed or suspected by most researchers that in a truly realistic model of gravity in four dimensions, the analog of this is actually not true. But there are subtle paradoxes involved in trying to understand why it is or isn't true. And well, that's one of the questions that's kind of on the frontier of the subject now. Now, there isn't time to explain everything. And I thought what I would do in the remaining time is to give an introduction to what Maria Mirzakhani did on the volumes. I know this is probably a very diverse audience. Some things I said may have been, uh, for some may have involved a familiar background and for some less so. And that may have been true for different people in different parts of the talk. I'm going to go in a slightly different direction in the rest of the talk and give you an introduction to Mariam Ritsukhani's work. And most probably there'll be some of you 
for which this last part of the talk will be um, more understandable than some of the things I've said so far, if you're willing to give, it, give me another try at hopefully being understandable. So a key tool in Mirtikani's work is something I already told you, that a hyperbolic Riemann surface Y, possibly with geodesic boundaries, can be built by gluing together three-held spheres, where I always assume my three-held spheres have geodesic boundaries. Here's another picture, in this case, a genus two surface, that is a, two handles, but with one boundary, and it can be built by gluing together three three-held spheres in the way shown here. They're glued together along their geodesic boundaries. Now, as I warned you before, the subtlety comes from the fact that there are many ways to do this. The same surface can be constructed in many, in fact, infinitely many ways, by gluing together three-held spheres. For this particular surface, you will always need three-held spheres, but there are uh, infinitely many choices of how to embed a three-held sphere, well, three three-held spheres. How to, there are infinitely many ways you could decompose um, this two manifold into three-held spheres. If you haven't worked on Riemann surfaces, you might have trouble visualizing how there could possibly be infinitely many choices. Because in this particular picture, there's one which is obvious, but instead of using these simple circles that are easy to see in the picture, there are more complicated circles that loop around in ways that look complicated in this picture, but with the simple in a different picture obtained by applying a diffeomorphism to this one. And these one, two, three, four circles that I've drawn on which you cut to get three three-held spheres could be replaced by completely different circles that loop around in, in ways that would look complicated in this picture. There are infinitely many ways to do that. For each way to do that, there's a picture that would look simple at the cost of making the other pictures look complicated. Now, if however, the picture was unique, there would be a simple way to calculate volumes. Here's yet another picture. Well, okay. Here's an example that will hopefully show you that there must be more than one way to build this surface out of three-held spheres because one way to do it is suggested here, but another way to do it is suggested here. Again, three three-held spheres making a surface that topologically is a genus two surface with one handle. So if this decomposition was unique, the volume of the big surface would actually have a simple representation where you just would integrate over B1 and B2. Sorry, I should have also integrated over, labeled this one B3 and integrated over B3. And then you'd have to, what you'd have to integrate would be the volumes of the individual moduli spaces. I didn't write this, sorry, this is not written quite properly. What I'm trying to say is that if the picture were unique, then to get the volume of the moduli space for the surface, you would just take the volumes for the pieces and integrate it over the gluing data, B1, B2, and B3. And that would give a simple recursion relation that would uh, build the big volume in terms of smaller volumes. But that's wrong because it would involve an infinite overcounting. There are infinitely many ways to pick a particular three-held sphere, lambda with a given boundary. Well, there are infinitely many, infinitely many decompositions like this. But a similar formula without integrating is actually correct if we view it as a formula for volume forms rather than integrated volumes. The formula can't be integrated to give the volumes because it does not take the mapping class group into account. It doesn't take into account the fact that there are infinitely many ways to draw this picture. To belabor the point, the, the, the moduli space we're talking about are moduli spaces of uh, solutions of Einstein equations or flat SL2R connections divided by the mapping class group. If we didn't have to divide by the mapping class group, for example, if we we're doing SU2 gauge theory instead of SL2R, hyperbolic metrics, then a simple recursion relation would actually be correct. But for gravity, nothing like that is valid because you have to divide by the mapping class group. That's the difficulty Mertzikani overcame. 
To explain the basic idea, consider any choice of a three-held sphere. This is supposed to be a three-held sphere like this one. One of its boundaries is the boundary of the whole surface. And then it has two internal boundaries. Consider any choice of such a lambda and let B1 and B2 be the other boundary lengths. Suppose there were a function f of B1, B, B1, and B2, such that the sum over all such three-held spheres gave one. Then the naive identity could be corrected by simply inserting a factor of f on the right-hand side. With the counting, well, with the counting all possible ways of drawing the picture, but by weighting them with this factor f that adds to one, we'd get the right answer. So that would compensate for the fact that the smaller surface has a smaller mapping class group than the larger one. Now the mathematician Luke McShane had found an identity of roughly the necessary form in a particular case, and Mirzakhani generalized it to the context that she needed, hyperbolic surfaces with geodesic boundaries. To explain how, pick one boundary gamma and a point P in it, and pick a three-held sphere that has gamma as one of its boundaries, and let L sub P be the geodesic orthogonal to gamma at P. So I've drawn a little piece of L sub P. We could continue it if we wanted to, and there are different things it might do depending on the details of the picture. If LP is continued, it might go on forever without intersecting itself or returning to the boundary it left from. It might return to the boundary it left from. It might leave Y by a different boundary, not possible in the case drawn where there's only one boundary, but in a moment I'll draw a picture where it is possible. Or it might intersect itself. Now, if it does not do zero, then it does one of one, two, or three first. There's a theorem of Berman and series that the probability of outcome zero is zero. So with probability one, the outcome will be one, two, or three. Probability means that the measure of the set of points on the boundary circle where outcome zero occurs is zero. That's a set of measure zero. The measures of the other sets add up to one. So here I'm illustrating the three possibilities. Here, the orthogonal P is a point orthogonal, sorry, P is a point in one of the boundaries. LP is a geodesic orthogonal to gamma at P and it continues until it leaves by a different boundary. In the second picture, it spirals around and intersects itself. And in the third picture, it goes around and returns to the boundary it entered from. So it, if it doesn't continue with measure zero, it might do none of those three, but with measure one, it'll do one of those three first. And I only care about which of the three happens first. Now, I've written in italics the key to uh, the work of Mirtikani and before that of McShane. In each case, a three-hold sphere with geodesic boundaries containing both LP and gamma is naturally determined. In parentheses, parentheses, I've written a sketch of the proof. The union of gamma, LP, and the other boundary gamma leaves by if it exists can be thickened slightly to give what is topologically a three-hold sphere. For example, look at A here. Here's gamma, that's a circle. There's another circle, gamma i. And then take LP, this geodesic written in the dotted lines. Thicken slightly the union of those three curves. With some mental gymnastics, you'll see that you get topologically a three-held sphere. Two of its boundaries are, are geodesics, namely gamma and gamma i. The third is not a geodesic, but if you minimize its length inside its homotopy class, you'll find a third geodesic, which here has been labeled L tilde, and the three of them are boundaries of a three-held sphere. Similarly, in the other two cases. In each case, by thickening slightly the union of gamma, LP, and possibly a other boundary, and then minimizing the lengths of all the boundaries, you get a three-held sphere with geodesic boundaries. So this leads to Mertzikhani's recursion relation. Let epsilon be the set of all three-held spheres that might that have gamma as one of their boundaries and two internal geodesics. Alternatively, you can have a set which have gamma 
as a boundary and another internal boundary gamma i. And then you have sets corresponding to the pictures A, B, or C. And they have some measures, which I'm calling mu of A and mu of B. Since gamma has total length B, we get a sum rule. So you see, almost any point in gamma will lead to one of these pictures except there's a set of measure zero that doesn't lead to any of these pictures. But if gamma has total length B, then B will be the sum of the measures of all the pictures that you can draw that involve a three-held sphere with gamma as one of its boundaries. So you get this sum rule. And the measures that come in here depend only on the three-held sphere that contains LP. So they can be computed once and for all by computation on the three-held sphere. There are certain universal functions that Mertzikhani computed and that you can consider known. Explicitly computable functions of the boundary lengths. So the sum rule takes an explicit form with explicit functions of the boundary lengths. And using this sum rule, Mertzikhani gets a corrected version of the naive identity. It's a little bit long to explain the details, so I won't. But schematically, B times the volume of a given surface, it's an integral, well, it's a sum over all pictures. Basic idea is you get a sum over all pictures that look like one of these three with an integral over the other boundary lengths that come in, the length of this one or this one, integral over internal lengths. And for each possible picture, a weighting by one of Mirtikani's universal functions, uh, which are basically B and T. And then the last factor, if you had, for example, this picture, you're, you're building this big surface out of something you understand times a smaller surface. The last factor that comes in is the volume for this smaller surface, the unshaded part of any one of these three pictures. So the formula becomes a recursion relation where the big volume is a universal function Mertzikhani computed, an integral over some gluing lengths, and then a volume of a smaller surface, one of these factors of V. So the three terms on the right-hand side of a recursion relation correspond to the three topologically distinct ways to make a surface Y by gluing a three-hold sphere lambda onto a simpler surface Y prime. So, uh, okay, that might have been more confusing than I was hoping to make it, but that's as much of a sketch of Ritsukhani's work as we really have time for. And I'll just make a few more remarks, which are just hints at different chapters of this subject that one would get to in different lectures. We've been in Euclidean signature today, which is efficient for computations, but it can obscure the physical meaning. If we continue to Lorentz signature, we find that the Lorentz signature analog of the hyperbolic disk, sometimes called anti de Sitter two space, can be described by this metric that I've written here. It's parameterized by time and also by a spatial coordinate sigma. And sigma runs over a finite interval, but the metric blows up at the ends. So the picture looks a bit like this, where the space time is the gray part. Time runs vertically, but sigma runs from left to right. But the boundaries at zero and pi are infinitely far away because of the factor of one over sine squared sigma. So those are virtual or conformal boundaries. When properly studied, this can be understood as a simple model of a black hole in one plus one dimensions. And the study of the model has shed some light on questions about black holes. But it, it would be a different, uh, unfortunately, it would be another lecture to explain why studying the Euclidean Lorentz signature version of the same model, first of all, gives a black hole model and secondly, an illuminating black hole model. Finally, we should ask to what extent the fact that the holographic dual of JT gravity 
is an ensemble of quantum systems rather than a specific quantum system will have analogs in higher dimensions? I'd say the answer to this question is quite unclear. I expressed my personal view before, I think it's the view of most researchers, which is that I believe that in a real four dimensional theory of quantum gravity, the dual will be a specific quantum system. But the mechanism by which that turns out to be true and the fundamental difference from the model of JT gravity in two dimensions is extremely unclear. And in three dimensions, there's a model of sort of intermediate complexity, pure Einstein gravity in three dimensions with no additional fields, which has attracted a lot of interest. It's not well understood. It's kind of intermediate between JT gravity and a realistic theory of four dimensional gravity. And its relation to an ensemble of quantum systems is again unclear at the moment. Well, thank you very much. And I'll be happy uh, to consider questions if there are any. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Witten. Uh, uh, can we uh, unmute uh, everybody just for a second? And can we uh, uh, have a round of applause, please? Yeah. Okay, so um, the way we are planning to I can't hear. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. I'm sorry, am I audible now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the, the way we're going ahead uh, um, as regards the, the QA, Q and A session is as follows. It's probably will not be to the liking of everybody on board right now, uh, but we got to be, uh, so there are folks who, who have written down their questions in the chat session while you were speaking. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna have uh, a few of them, and I would probably just read them out to you, and would request you to please answer them. Will that be okay? Sure, but I can see the chat myself, so I can read the questions. Excellent. Okay. okay. Uh, well, one question was why time has only one direction. It's not a very good match for my talk. Um, Uh, we have filtered the question out for you. So, uh, Professor Mishan will be presenting with the filtered uh, question. I can't help you. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, yeah, what my, my, uh, what uh, Rishab, the, uh, my co host here from the, uh, uh, the Physics and Astronomy Club, what he's suggesting is uh, this is the reason why uh, we thought of actually filtering out the questions and uh, then reading them out to you so that you don't okay. have to go through all of them. Will that be okay? No, that's, that's fine. Sure. Okay. Great. Cool. So, um, so there is a there is a question uh, which says, um, uh, would you would you agree to take uh, slightly generic questions pertaining to superstring theory or no? Well, I will, but if they're too far afield from my lecture, I'd like to move on. Sure. Okay. Uh, so I, I think I'd, I'd venture to put uh, forth the following question. The question is: There's a there's somebody by the name of Shrey Gogia. And the question is, uh, what Trey asks is, given that the LHC has not been able to detect supersymmetric particles, what are the directions in which superstring theory is now proceeding? I actually think the most exciting current development is that there's been some advance in, glimmers of advance in conceptual understanding of quantum gravity. And uh, the way I approach it may have been too technical, but. I was trying to um, explain a little bit, a little bit of the background. I'm pretty sure you're going to get more from Maldesaner. Um, so, uh, what I uh, largely, although not entirely, it's been simulated by developments coming from holographic duality. That um, we at least, well, it, I mean. It's hard to tell how significant, substantial the progress is, but I think for the first time in my career, in the last decade, but especially in the last five years, it seems like there's really some progress in grappling with quantum gravity at a somewhat more conceptual level. And 
I mean, the main way it's somewhat made contact with string theory so far is that holographic duality is one of the main influences and is basically understood in the context of string theory. All the concrete examples, at least in four dimensions, come from string theory. All the concrete examples that are known. Um, I'd say we're missing some general lessons about what quantum gravity means conceptually. We're also missing a general understanding of what string theory really means. I can't promise the two will make contact, but uh, a dream is that they would make contact. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, so there was a question uh, more directly related to your talk, and uh, that's a question by Adhrit Ravi Chandran. He says that in T, in D equals two, the curvature is an intrinsic property of space, and there is no non-zero curvature, even in the absence of matter. How does one intuitively understand this? Uh, well, in, rather than no curvature, I'd say the curvature is uniquely determined in the absence of matter. Uh, it, it's because, the, technically, it's because the Riemann tensor in two dimensions reduces to the Ricci scalar. And in the theory we were discussing, the Einstein equations determine the Ricci scalar. And therefore, the geometry locally is uniquely determined. Uh, I'm afraid that's a somewhat technical answer to your question. Okay. Um, so there was a question by uh, Roshan Raj, uh, and the question is, what is so special about three-hole spheres? Do such treatments on three-hole spheres also equivalently hold true for higher-hole spheres, et cetera? Or no, the three-hole sphere is unique. Um, I'm not sure what's the best way to say why. Uh, the number three comes up in so many different places. The, I didn't emphasize the symmetry group of this hyperbolic geometry, but locally it has the symmetry SL2R, which is a three dimensional Lie group. And that's the same three. The three occurs everywhere. So the three hold sphere is unique in that its geometry is unique when you specify the boundary lengths. That's true only, only for three hold sphere. If I were able to draw, I would show why, but I wasn't able to share a whiteboard. Uh, I've, I used to know how, but I've forgotten. Okay. It, if you had a four-hold sphere, you could glue it by gluing together two three-hold spheres along an internal boundary. And then the yeah. length of that internal boundary would be a parameter. I guess what's unique about the three-hold sphere is that topologically, you can't build it out of simpler pieces. The four-hold sphere, well, technically you want pieces with negative Euler characteristic. Yeah. It's Euler characteristic is minus one, so you can't build it out. Minus one is not the sum of two negative integers. That's it. Okay. okay. Professor, if you want to share your whiteboard, you can still share it. You, if you click on the share screen option, there shows an option of whiteboard. What do I have to do? There's a share screen uh, button there in green. Yes. If you click that, you'll see a whiteboard option. That I don't... I'm not seeing it. I have in the past, but I don't see it today. Okay, I think... Uh... Oh, no, I do, I do. You're right, you're right. I see it now. Okay. 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 Yeah. What I was going to do, what I said was, let's take a four-hold sphere. Okay. And now you're discovering I'm not very good at drawing on the whiteboard, now that I don't have an excuse, because we do have whiteboard. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> trying to draw, oh, sorry. No, what did I do wrong? Oh. Sorry. Ah, okay, sorry. Well, after a little while, we're going to have a four-hold sphere topologically. Now, all I said was that a four-hold sphere can be built by gluing together two three-hold spheres. So it's a reducible object, but a three-hold sphere is not similarly reducible. You can build a four-hold sphere out of three-hold spheres, but you can't build a three-hold sphere out of two-hold spheres. That's what's special about three, or one way to explain what's special. Fine. Um, okay. Anyway, no. uh, okay. Good. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No. That, go on to another question. I would say. Okay. All right. Good. Um, let's see. Um, 
So there is a question by um, uh, Anson Chung, uh, and the question is, is it possible to do an asymptotic expansion of your singe function and the sum of delta functions to resolve the quantum classical difference in your partition function? Well, you can do all kinds of asymptotic expansions, but the singe function simply disagrees with a unique quantum system. It agrees with an ensemble of quantum systems. So um, okay. whatever expansion we make won't change that. Uh, for example, you could look at the singe function at small energies, which corresponds to low temperatures or at high energies, which corresponds to high temperatures. They're both interesting, but um, you can't turn the singe function into a sum of delta functions. You can only approximate it by a sum of delta functions when S naught is large. Okay. Um, um, I, I don't see uh, more questions that uh, I would uh, that I, I would frankly uh, uh, put forward uh, put forth uh, to you. And um, I, I actually, uh, in, uh, in lieu of that, uh, with your permission, I just wanted to ask. Uh, just I uh, had a couple of things uh, uh, which I actually uh, uh, wanted to. Uh, uh, now that we have you here for the time being, I just uh, very curious, very very curious to know. One is that. Uh, so this is based on uh, your Santa Barbara talk actually earlier this year. And this is, this, this is basically something that you didn't quite touch upon in today's uh, lecture of yours, uh, which is actually uh, the story for uh, uh, super Riemann surfaces and um, uh, unoriented Riemann surfaces with hyperbolic structure. Yes. Uh, so uh, what I'm very curious to know is that uh, um, what is the obstruction in actually formulating an intersection theory for uh, the, Mumf uh, the Mumford, Morita, Miller type uh, tautological classes for super manifolds. Uh, I, I see that there's a remark that you make there in your talk and also I think the, the follow up uh, on that, the written uh, e-print on that. That's my first question. In particular, I'm very curious to know if you have analogs of your conjecture, which you, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, which you which you have for uh, you know just for the con in the context of uh, Riemann surfaces and uh, the um, do, is there a conjecture for super manifold super Riemann surfaces as well and the, the second and the last part of the the same question is uh, though not related to super Riemann manifolds but uh, uh, how how does the story uh, become more non-trivial when you have uh, unoriented Riemann surfaces of hyperbolic structure. Okay, well, the first question is what's different about super Riemann surfaces from ordinary Riemann surfaces so that you can't really do intersection theory? Yeah. So um, the answer is simply that uh, in intersection theory, you're studying intersections of cohomology classes. And like you have a two form. So a two form has two bosonic directions, so it's in real co dimension two. There isn't a a good fermionic analog of cohomology. So um, there is simply no intersection theory in fermionic directions. Okay, but isn't there, like for example, when, when people um, long so back, you said, sorry, yeah. Let me tell you what you can do instead. Okay. Murtzikhani showed, well, Murtzikhani gave a new proof of my conjecture, which was, my conjecture was originally proved by Kinsevich. Mm -hmm. Murtzikhani proved yeah. my conjecture. And a step in proving it was to show that the volumes contained the same information as the intersection numbers. Um, now, in, in the opposite direction, that's more obvious that the intersection numbers determine the volumes was obvious uh, before I became involved. It was obvious in the work of Mumford and others roughly 40 or 45 years ago. That the volume, okay, that the intersection numbers determine the volumes is more obvious, but that the volumes determine the intersection numbers if you include surfaces with boundary was a result of Mertzikhani's, although probably not as deep as some of the other things she did. So um, the intersection numbers don't have direct analogs, but the volumes do. And Mertzikhani had showed that the volumes contain the information of the intersection numbers. So computing the super volumes is a good super analog of computing the intersection numbers in the bosonic case. In other words, the volumes are the right generalization of the, the bosonic theory. You could do intersection theory, but Mertzikhani showed equivalent that you can compute volumes. The first one, you can't generalize to super Riemann surfaces, but the second, you can. And 
Stanford and I computed the volumes. So I'd say our formulas are the analog for superhuman surfaces of my conjecture in the bosonic case. Okay. And we essentially proved the formulas. Um, a mathematician might say you should add some epsilons and deltas, but basically we proved the formulas. We did it by imitating Mitsukani's proof in the bosonic case. It's quite amazing. I couldn't believe it actually, but it turns out that every step in Mitsukani's proof has got a good super analog. You can read all about it in my paper with Douglas Stanford. Uh, I, just in the, the same context, I remember that the the density of states uh, density of states that you get in the context of superhuman surfaces is like a cosh of some of square root e divided by square root e. So uh, how come? I mean, I mean, uh, uh, like for example, as you also put it, that what you're doing is you're replacing the SL2R by an OSP one uh, two. Uh, yes. I mean, how does that change the density of state so much that the singularity structures change so drastically? I mean, can you, can you, is there a way of going from uh, the super Riemann surface result to the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the result that you've talked about today? There's an easy explanation. In the supersymmetric case, the Hamiltonian is the square of the supercharge. Okay. Now, if Q psi equals lambda psi, then h psi will be lambda squared psi. So the relation between e and lambda is just e equals lambda squared. And okay. the measure for lambda, for lambda, nothing special is possible. It happens near zero. So the measure is d lambda, but that turns into de over the square root of a. Maybe with okay. a two, probably. Okay. I think there's a two here. So, in terms of Q, there's nothing special about the energy being zero, but in terms of H, there is, because the energy was the square of lambda. So, this simple formula explains why we got dE over the square root of E. Okay. Well, in hindsight, it explains it. The formula with dE over the square root of E was computed in an earlier paper by Shanker, uh, Stanford and me. Okay. Um, at the time, we didn't know what to make of this formula. But in our later paper, where we computed these super volumes, we have this explanation that I just explained to you. Okay. And uh, so I, get, I guess we're going to conclude this uh, Q&A session with a, with a question which is uh, coming to you from uh, in fact, I consider myself to be uh, one of those, uh, though it's coming from a student pr probably, but uh, uh, when it comes to you, uh, I, that's what I consider myself, uh, frankly. And the question is this, uh, I'm sure you must have gotten this uh, so many places so many times, but yet again, could you please give some advice to students aspiring to work in uh, so what the word uses, fundamental physics or basic physics or fundamental sciences or basic sciences? Well, the only real advice I can do is study real hard and learn as much as you can when you're young. It'll come in handy. Uh, I just wanted to make this little uh, comment uh, to any to everybody who's listening. Uh, Professor Witten, actually, uh, uh, I, I think if I remember correctly, you've got a bachelor's in journalism, right? Well, roughly. But I can tell you that I've spent the rest of my life trying to learn things that I could have learned as an undergraduate if I had concentrated on physics and math. So I don't recommend my trajectory to other people. Okay, all right. So I think uh, uh, I, I, we, uh, we have no words to thank you, Professor Witten, for uh, kindly accepting our, inv our invitation to uh, deliver this uh, Mysteries of the Universe uh, lecture as part of the, uh, uh, the Institute of Lecture Series here. Uh, at um, uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Rurki, though only virtually, but at least thank God for that. We are so grateful. Thank you so much, Professor Witten. Um, so uh, I think uh, with this, yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you. Thank and you. I'd like to, well, first of all, stay safe, everyone. Secondly, all good fortune, especially to the students. I wasn't able to give much advice, but hopefully you didn't need it. So good luck. Thank you so much, Professor Whitten. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. We're very grateful. Really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank Have you. a good day. Have a good day. 
So uh, I think with this, we come to the conclusion of today's lecture. I, we all, all of us, especially, I would like to thank what, who I call as the Packers, the Physics and Astronomy Club, and also uh, the, um, the Indian Physics Association Drumkey chapter folks, uh, who have been uh, the real, uh, the driving force behind organizing uh, all of these lectures. Thank you, I have no words, thank you. Uh, again, please stay safe uh, and uh, see you all, uh, I believe, 31st, October 31st, which is the last day of uh, this month with the Conrad Maffa's talk. So till then, bye-bye. Thank uh, you, Professor Whitten. Bye. Excuse me, sir. Uh, one, one more thing to all the participants here. Yeah. Uh, there's a form link in the chat. Could you all please go and go to that link and just fill it, fill it up? That will be fine. Thank you. Yeah, you're about 150 participants too late. <laughs> Most of them are logged out. But anyways, I'm ending the meeting, yeah? Great work. Bye. Somebody stop the